Welcome to a special bonus episode of Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is Public Power's premier infotainment program that covers public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. I'm Paul Dockery, the creative director of Public Power Underground and manager of the power department for Clients Can IPUD. In this bonus episode, Matthew Shretnick and I talk to the new executive director of the public generating pool, Mary Wenke. We go deep into EDAM Markets Plus, talk about the diversity of public power, play a fun game at intermission, and get insights into deep and nerdy market topics, including market expansion, and carbon pricing. If you listen to last week's episode, there is a portion repeated here. It is at not, it is not at the start of the episode. It is in the middle. So if you find yourself remembering the fantastic conversation and for some reason decide you want to skip it, just hit the, the skip forward a few times uh, and then you'll hear some new content afterwards. Uh, but before we get to the interview, a word from our presenting sponsor. The presenting sponsor of Public Power Underground is the Energy Authority. The Energy Authority is a nonprofit energy portfolio management company owned by public power entities like us. TEA's mission is to help clients maximize the value of their assets and meet their power supply goals. TEA does this by providing expertise in energy trading, advanced analytics, renewable solutions, and a whole lot more. Over 60 public power utilities have partnered with TEA to tackle their energy future. So if you're looking for an energy authority to partner with in navigating the uncertain future of our industry, visit TEAINC.org to learn more. That's TEAINC.org, Inc with a C as in incorporated, not Inc as in the pen stuff, Inc. Incorporate Inc. T E A I N C dot org. The Energy Authority, they're as underground as it gets. With that intro, I hand it over to Matthew Shretnik, eWeb's power planning supervisor and staff counsel, to get us started. Today, Paul and I are joined by Mary Winky, the new executive director uh, for PGP or the Public Generating Pool, um, who generously agreed to lend her considerable expertise to a number of market topics and questions. Uh, Mary joined PGP in January after spending about 14 years holding positions of increasing responsibility and importance at Pacific Corp. Uh, do you say Pacific Corp or Pacific Corp? Pacific Corp. All right, good. The other one is wrong. Uh, <laughs> most recently, Mary was Pacific Corp's Vice President of Transmission Regulation and Market Policy. Mary is a graduate of Barnard College. Is it Barnard or Barnard? Barnard. Barnard College and Lewis and Clark Law School. She began her career at Pacific Core as mm -hmm. an attorney and succeeds friend of the underground and Northwest public power icon, Therese Hampton, as PGP's executive director. It's so good to have you, Mary. I'm very happy that you agreed to join us. So great Thanks to have you. Me. And again, welcome to Public Power Underground. Um, actually, my cousin went to uh, Barnard and um, she, had, she gave birth to twins yesterday, uh, which is uh, crazy on two different levels, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, that's not the point. The point is, welcome. <laughs> Very excited to have you. I'm, you. I'm excited to be here. Do you do you know what you're getting into? It's a standard question for all of our guests. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm sure I want to do this. Okay, this is going to be fun. Last chance. <laughs> So you've been at PGP for about six weeks. First question, just orienting us, what has been like surprised you the most about either PGP or public power uh, in your introduction to the us weirdos in public power? I'm gonna cut that <laughs> probably, but we'll roll with it for now. <laughs> you know, I, I, th I think that the most interesting thing so far has been really getting to know the diversity of public power. I think that it, at Pacific Core and being in an IOU for so long, I I, I sort of thought of, of of public power as a little bit of a um a, a, the same I think, and I think really starting to get to know okay, there's so many different entities who have different perspectives and are really have have come up in a certain way in a certain place with certain histories and and all that really kind of comes into this kind of public power ecosystem um, that I think I think I just didn't really realize all of kind of the the ways in which it's diverse and um, has different perspectives within Northwest public power um, as well as kind of across the West you know I just think it's 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 fascinating kind of the the diversity of entities and kind of um, perspectives and cultural inputs so that's really been a learning experience for me that I didn't really anticipate. 
So and would you call that a positive experience of learning all that diversity or is it still in the fairly difficult early stages about managing a bunch of diverse interests? Well, I think it's really, I just think it's fascinating and, and probably, you know, my, and, and, you know, hopefully I don't insult anybody in this interview coming from, you know, from no, I'm that's our a little job. bit of an outsider coming in, but I, it sort of feels like the diversity and the, and the, and the different voices and perspectives are both kind of the best thing about public power and probably the worst thing because, you know, it's, it, it is, you know, it enables local control and for people to really have the ability to, to make decisions and control their destinies and kind of be um, their own entities, I think in a way that the IOUs don't, don't really get that opportunity in the same way. Um, but then I think it's also really hard to get everybody in the same room and kind of rowing the boat in the same direction and, and sometimes that's needed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's probably both a little bit of a blessing and a curse at the same time. That's my that's my initial perspective. That may change and ask me that again in another year. I might have a different answer. I think uh, I think that's well said. I think our jobs might be a lot easier, yours especially, if we were a little more one dimensional overall. Um, but uh, it's also what makes it interesting yeah. uh, and keeps it fun. So um, yeah, yeah. With regard to keeping everybody rowing in the same direction, that's I mean that is where you come in, right? Um, e uh, full disclosure, eWeb, uh, my, my employer is a member of, of PGP, an enthusiastic one, um, and we are excited to have you on board there as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, with respect to, to, to the rowing aspect and keeping everybody aligned, um, I'd be kind of curious as to your, your thoughts there with respect to the diversity. And, and um, it seems like, uh, in particular with the market efforts, not to signal some of the stuff we're going to be talking about later, but um, uh, you do have a relatively diverse um, uh, constituency, membership group. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Choose your choose your word membership. there. Uh, keeping us all aligned. Um, uh, I'd say more than a full time job. Um, be interested to hear a little more about that if you're willing. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, and, and again, this is my preliminary take on it, but I, but I think it's really, I, I think it's, I wouldn't start the conversation with, okay, let's get everybody aligned. Because I think then that sort of puts people in a position of, okay, I'm going to have to change kind of who I am in order to be like this person or have the same opinion as that entity. And I think, I think the really, the, the challenge of it is really finding where are the commonalities, you know, and distilling sort of what are the common objectives, you know, and identifying, you know, where can we be the most effective by identifying where those commonalities are, you know? So I think it's it's in part trying to find those commonalities, but then it's also in part for the members kind of figuring out where to focus, you know, that, that if there's too much diversity on a particular topic, maybe, we, maybe PGP is not the spokesperson for the membership on that topic. You know, so so it's a it's it's a it's a challenge to kind of identify priorities and then also kind of find commonalities among those priorities such that the group is sort of better off as a whole or sees itself that way. So sort of the opposite of transactional politics from an advocacy perspective. Instead of saying, "All right, you want this and I want this," let's let's figure out how we get that. Um, start with what we have in common and what we can agree on, and build upon that. That's, a, that's the idea anyway, we'll see. I, I don't know yet if, if it works, but I do have, you know, at Pacificor, you know, I don't know how familiar anybody is with Pacificor, but you do have six states, um, all with very different perspectives and interests. And so there's a lot of work, probably anybody who works at Pacificor is, is engaged in some of this kind of, okay, there's a common good here that, we all are dedicated to in some way and then how can we kind of focus on that and kind of figure out how to manage forward when we disagree on a lot of specific topics that's a skill i think that'll come in very handy in the northwest where a lot of our issues are with diverse uh utilities across that same diverse footprint. Um, so it, it, that is a helpful skill set to bring along to maybe help us learn some lessons you maybe garnered from Pacific Core. So I'm going to just come in and say, really glad to have you. I am, Klatskin IPUD is not a member of PGP, uh, you know, but happy to have you in the region for sure. Collaboration. Yeah. Yet. Yet. 
I mean, yet. Yeah. <laughs> could happen. Could, could happen. It could. It could happen. We'll see. All right. Uh, so, Mary, we're going to take a, a quick break uh, for capitalism. Are you willing to chat a little bit more about market efforts and uh, and the West when we come back? Absolutely. And play Thank a game. You very much. We're going to play and, a game over in a mission. And play a game. Northwest Public Power Association believes in public power. For 82 years, NWPPA has supported public power utilities and other associates in greater Pacific Northwest by offering education, training, communications, government relations, and services like RFP and job postings. In addition to public power, what else is important to NWPPA? Local control, member needs, integrity, and quality products and services. Today, NWPPA proudly serves 155 member utilities and more than 325 utility industry associate members. Learn more or register for a class at nwppa.org. That's nwppa.org. Believe in public power. Now back to Mary and Matt for more. Okay. Mary, during the intermission, I came up with a game. This may be, I may have put a lot more effort into this game than, I don't know, the rest of the episode, but I'm here for, are you ready for an intermission game on market enthusiast, enthusiasm? I'm ready. Okay. It's like pop culture markets where they overlap. Multiple choice. Matt, I'm going to put you on the spot too. We're going to just have Mary go first because she's our guest. And then you're going to have to like have another opinion to, to come in at the end. You're going to have to answer all the questions too though, Matt. Noted. Okay. So are you ready? First question. It's a question I actually, I, 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 talk, I asked Therese Hampton this when she was last on the episode. What is the best name for one of the Western market efforts? Multiple choice. Indigo, great name, MC, or The Wrap? Now, am I supposed to explain my answer or just answer? You answer, and we'll let Matt answer, and then I will just uh, make you two fight about it, I think. We'll just try it. Let's see what happens on the first one. I mean, I have to go with Indigo. It's I just a great it's, name, right? It's, it's a great just name. It's kind of cute. Yeah, it's very cute. Matt, what's yours? Um, I, my knee-jerk reaction was to agree, but I'm not going to do that because I That's want this good. to be Thank interesting. Good so content. we're going to go. Yeah, we're going to go with MC uh, simply because, you know, it's a uh, eye in the sky, uh, right? It's going to be controlling controlling everything. You've got your your market coordinator. Um, uh, you want uh, just like at you any event. You need some yeah, good beats exactly. in this market. You got to drop a new track. <laughs> this is kind of where I was trying to go with that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Saved we got to drop some new beats. Yeah, it's great. I'm up. Yeah. Therese was surprised when I went with MC. I really, I think that's a great one. Anyway, next up. This is one of, I think this is one of my more beautiful. Also, after questions. lunch, if it were before lunch, I might have gone with that. Yeah, true. Okay, if Kaiso were a children's television show, which show would it be? Okay, I've got a bunch of options here. Okay, Molly of Denali, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Wild Kratz, Bluey, Octonauts, Ada Twist Scientist, Sesame Street, Spirit, one of my favorites. Trash truck. That's a real show. I'm not just throwing trash, just throwing shade at Kaiso and stinky and dirty. Also a real show. Really good show. If uh, your kids haven't watched it yet, stinky and dirty is great content. Which would it be? We're going to start with you, Mary. Okay. And, and this will be caveated by the fact that I'm not quite familiar with all of these shows. I probably should be, I probably will be uh, some someday, but um, I was, I, I went with Ada twist scientist. I think a lot of uh, very earnest very earnest smart people at kaiso absolutely yes they're doing their uh their i don't know all their games that's great and matt what's yours uh, I, I so the earnest response i respect it uh so i'm going to change what was going to be my previous answer Ooh, yeah please uh do. yeah and I'll, I'll go with bluey um i'll go with bluey because um clearly trying to have a good time but doing it in a way that is just entirely foreign to me um and you know they're kiwis uh i like the accent but um the approach to problem solving is is uh foreign and uh i recommend all of these shows mary i have picked a, i mean I, I know because we've had a prior conversation you have small children like matt and i they we haven't gotten far enough along to see bluey yet apparently I, the oldest one is six, so I don't oh, know if that's this just... is This is right, and I have a six-year-old. This is right in Bluey range. I okay. cannot... My I, three-year-old all of these loves recommend. it, so... All yeah. right, we'll have, to, we'll have to look it up. I'll um, have to look it up. We're just not as up on our uh, children's TV culture, I guess. Yeah, I know four of these. Better, better parent I... than, uh, than I am. It's fine. 
I'm not going to take it personally. Okay, which <laughs> character in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood would the Western power pool be? Uh, so I'm going with oh. Daniel. Daniel, oh. I, I was supposed to give you the list. You you, you got it though. Oh, you go with Daniel Tiger. No, I, I I it was my mess up. That's over here. That's on this guy. Okay. You're going with Daniel Tiger. Yeah, I think a lot of uh um learning and growing happening there. Learning and growing, I like it. What about this you, Matt? Is, your answers are great. Um I'm going with the owl because it's just kind of it's it, there to the side. Every once in a while you see it, it's gonna play a role, and you know, uh, that role could be bigger in the future. We don't necessarily know, but uh loves it, to learn. Loves to learn, not and but not also not uh, not core just yet, uh, not essential for the success just yet. Just yet. The other options I had, which I didn't list because I failed in this game, was King Friday. I thought was a good option, and Lady Elaine Fairchild also a good option. Okay, I have no options for the next one because it's too broad of a category. So I'm going to lean on you to a fill in the blank. If the Southwest Power Pool were a Disney character, which would it be? So I did. I did a little bit of searching on this, nice. and I I picked uh, Lumiere from Lumiere from um, what's it? Beauty and the Beast. You know, they're oh, the, was that the candle? Yeah, the candle. Be our guest. You know, yeah. be our guest. Be our guest. Like it's very Southwest Harpool is very, um, um, you know, wants to love the West. You know is sort of how i would characterize it and and is very wants to be accommodating and they they have a very uh member driven process where they sort of are are aim to accommodate what the members want to do and so i kind of see that as very solicitous and and um like the furniture in uh beauty and the beast yeah be our guest that's really good lumi lumiere i'm lumiere. not to look I'm gonna look that that's up. probably not the French. The French pronunciation is probably. I'll ask Luigi. Luigi is our native French speaker, so yeah. we'll get her to tell you the pronunciation. Correctly. Yeah. What about you, Matt? That that is a phenomenal response. Yeah. Um, You're uh, really getting would... blown away in this, Matt. You just yeah, really blown it's... away. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I need my own soundboard. Yep. Um, I was going with flounder for for kind of similar reasons. Ooh. Right? So okay. Um, well, you know, not a great um, name, though. Not a great name. Not the best name. And, you know, leaving aside um, uh, many of the issues with the movie itself, uh, The Little Mermaid, you know, Flounder, Flounder is uh, supportive there. Uh, Ernest uh, wants the best uh, and, and is trying very hard to be helpful. Um, and, you know, for some of the similar reasons that Mary listed, although not, not uh, providing nearly as good an end result, um, uh, I ended up going with the fish. Okay. We got a, a candle and a fish. Okay. The next one is uh, some Lord of the Rings markets crossover here. Okay. There are nine members in the Fellowship of the Ring. There are nine markets in the U.S. And what I want you to do is match the character who is in a member of the Fellowship of the Ring with one of the U.S. power markets. Okay. For everybody's reference, the members of the Fellowship of the Ring... And I, you guys are just going to have to work together on this. I, I'm going to try to take notes to make sure you catch them all. But we're just because there are nine and nine. So it's going to take a little longer. But I'm very invested in this. OK, Frodo Baggins, Samwise Gamgee, Peregrine Took, Mary Doc Brandybuck, Aragon, Boromir, Legolas, Gandalf and Gimli. OK, those are the nine members on the Fellowship of the Ring. The markets are Kaiso, my, I, you know, know all these, but I'm gonna listen for our listeners. Not all our listeners will have this on top of mine. I'm not, yeah, yeah. Kaiso, Miso, ISO New England, New York ISO, PJM, Southwest Power Pool, ERCOT, the Southeast Exchange, Energy Exchange Market, SEAM, and the Western Bilateral Market, okay? So nine and nine, I'm gonna go one at a time and you tell me which character they match up with. Kaiso. I, uh oh, where do I have Kaiso? Did I forget Kaiso? I'm I'm gonna have to go with Mary because that's the last one. That was <laughs> okay, Meridoc, uh, Brandy Buck, you love it. I, I went Legolas. You went Legolas. Oh, I also did. great. Okay, what is this? This is, uh, this is great content. Any content? <laughs> so, uh, Miso, what do you got, Mary? Uh, Miso Boromir. Oh, uh, Boromir, really? Uh, that's our cut. 
Or yeah, co- I was going with third Oh, uh, so. yeah. Ooh, man. I mean, he really. Okay. What did you have, Matt? What did you have for ISO? Mary. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I like that. That's good. Okay. ISO New England. I had Gandalf. Yeah, that's Gandalf. That's right. Yeah. You got alignment here. This is, that's the bell. Wow. That's the bell. Bam. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, New York ISO. Aragorn. I went Gimli. You want okay. Gimli? I, I could see okay. it. I could see it. Okay. I mean, Matt's wrong, obviously. <laughs> okay. PJM. Frodo. Nice. Really? Frodo. Nice. We have alignment. We have two Frodo's for PJM. Southwest Power Pool. <laughs> uh, Peregrine took. No, no, no. I'm sorry. That's Seam. Uh, Legolas. Legolas. Okay. That. Okay, I like I like where you're heading there. It's uh, interesting. You picked Southwest Power Pool for Lego Lost Night Kai. So Matt, what do you have? I put Sam. I'm, uh, you know, I might be a little too hopeful there, but here we are. Yeah, you gotta love some Samwise Gamgee. Actually, I think that's pretty good. Urcot, what do you got, Mary? Gimli. Okay, Matt. Ormir. We know that. Oh, we did. Yeah, that was. I think. I'm sorry, Mary. I think Matt won that one. I thought I thought Urcot, you know, dwarfs like to kind of go it alone. That's how Urcot rolls. Yeah, that was my, that was my thinking. Okay, yeah, we, just... Matt, Matt went with the darker side of Boromir. I think yeah. is what he went with the Urcot thing, which is yeah. you know maybe not fair, Matt. We should really have a self reflective a sense. We, of we should. Our, our, our maybe not on this episode though. Yeah, let's not do it on this episode. <laughs> Southeast Exchange Seam, Southeast Energy Exchange Market. Peregrine took. Okay. Same. Oh, good. whoa. We got, a, we got another one. We got wow. another one. It, it, in my defense, pretty well. in my defense, that one, because that's what I had left at the end. Yeah. So I backed into it. Okay. Well, uh, the Western bilateral market, if I were following close enough, I would know exactly who you both picked. I, you didn't pick, pick Frodo. So who is the Western bilateral market, Mary? Uh, Samwise Gamgee. Oh, that is the best one. I think she won that one. Well, I'd say I went Aragorn. But... Really? Yeah. Okay. Main character energy there. Yeah. That's very self-centered. That's very egocentric <laughs> of you, Matt. Uh, okay. You won the game. Uh, bonus question, though. I forgot my bonus question. Uh, which Ted Lasso character is SPP? Mary, have you seen Ted Lasso? I've only seen like one episode. Ooh, I don't know yeah, if you could so. pick up from the first episode. Any guesses? It's Ted fill in the Lasso? blank. Yeah, I don't mm. know. Sorry. No, I don't think. I don't think. I mean, that actually probably isn't bad. I think there's a right answer here, though. Matt, what do you think? It, it Keely Jones, without it's Keely question. Jones, without question. Yeah. Yeah. She's, a, she's a connector. She, Keely Jones is the connector. She's the glue that holds that cast together, for sure. <laughs> okay, we won the game. We all won the game. Thank you very right. much. I've, right. I've really invested a lot in that game, and I appreciate you coming along with me for the ride. Mary, I feel like you ended up learning more th- about us than we did about you there, but I'll call it a win nonetheless. I think the best interviews are kind of, mu- there's mutual learning involved, so. It's Agreed. Good. Agreed. Uh, James lipton Uh And we are back from intermission. Um, you've got more history and context, Mary, on market development than just about anybody in the region um, from multiple perspectives as well. Uh, you were at Pacific Corps when they were first entrance, uh, the first entrance into the EIM from outside of the CAISO. Uh, and also when they were, uh, considering, uh, PTO or becoming a participating transmission owner. Um, so given your level of expertise, uh, on markets overall and market development, uh, what do you think we should be paying attention to as the region continues to evaluate market expansion? Um, and kind of throw in a follow-up question here, which may very well be more important, at least from my perspective, is what, what is interesting to you uh, about this at this point? So obviously, um, really loaded, couple of loaded questions. Um, no, there. no apologies. <laughs> you know, and I think, I think, uh, you know, um, I think the, I think people should be really paying attention to the places where they know that kind of the fault lines have occurred in the past. And I know that you guys, Paul told me that um, Therese and Steve came on already to talk about the PGP uh, market retrospective. Um, Some great work, great work done by PGP. Yes, it's it's on our website in case anybody wants to um, read it or learn more, feel free to contact us. Uh, We'll link to it in notes. 
Yeah, we'll link to in the show notes. Yep. Yeah. Um, I but I think if you look across, you know, if you look across, like w- this isn't the this isn't our first rodeo in the West, and in addition, this isn't the first rodeo across the country. So I I think really taking lessons from history and looking at kind of where we know the fault lines are and where we know the challenges are and and thinking through okay how can we how can we navigate through these this time and and so i i think that's what people should be keeping an eye on as we go through these conversations and not getting sort of too stuck on the the outcome or the the end state you know, like I think there's a certain key set of object objectives and a certain fault lines that have happened in the past. And, and we need to work through those through those things sort of regardless in what context or in what form kind of the market develops. So I think I think we kind of keep an open mind to a certain extent on what that end state looks like, but really kind of focus on, like I say, where we know the the um, kind of touch points are from our past. Um, That said, I also think that there's differences now. And so people should also be focusing on what those differences are. And that kind of gets to your second question about sort of what is really interesting to me, Um, because I think one of the key aspects of um, that's different now from the other from those other efforts is this the the manner in which state energy policy has evolved um, since those efforts and and I think Washington is a really prime example of that and so you have markets developing in the context of state policies that are really driving um, decarbonization and driving um, a, a more sort of granular understanding of sort of um, how state how states are being served and by which resources, and so I think to to me that's a re- this sort of intersection of state policy and market development is just is super fascinating um, because you can have you can have state policies whose objectives are ultimately the same as some of the market objectives in terms of integrating renewables and and those sorts of things. Um, But you could actually have the sort of implementation of the policy and the implementation of the market sort of at cross purposes a little bit. So I think it's, it's just, it's, it's just super fascinating. It's super complex. That's what I really, you know, I'm, I'm super interested in, um, you know, I'd love to kind of get into the nitty gritty there. And I think, I think if we can kind of resolve some of those challenging issues um, on that intersection, I, I do think that that we'll sort of find a path forward. Um, so I don't know, that was kind of a long winded answer to your, to your question. Um, but, you know, that was actually one of the reasons that was really attracted me to uh, PGP is that PGP is really engaged on both carbon policy and market policy and there's a really inter- interesting intersection there that not everybody gets to kind of have the chance and opportunity to work on both um so very interesting times i'm gonna ask what is a probably a naive question but i can because i'm here um there there is also you talk about state policies and then the market policies overlapping and, and that intersection i think uh that's a, a really interesting touch point. There's also seems to be a trend where the state policy is explicitly uh, market, like joining a market. Do you think that's a trend that is likely to continue? And off the top of my head, Colorado, I think uh, that is a state policy now that those utilities are are asked to join a market. Um, Do you think that'll continue? And do you think that's going to be a trend out here and am I missing something that's so obvious? I miss a lot of obvious things, Mary. Don't, uh, I'm not an expert, I'm an enthusiast. These are different things. I, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, both Nevada and Colorado have um, statutes in place that require the utilities to join an RTO by I, I believe 2030. Um, there's some off ramps, you know, it's, it's not sort of a mandatory no matter what um, sort of requirement, but I, I do think we could see more conversations about that um, in states across the West, you know, as people um, 
see RTOs as kind of a and, and, and moving in that direction as kind of a tool um, to achieve other state energy policies. And so I do, I do think we'll probably see more conversation on that. Um, I don't have any more insight though as to sort of specifics on on where and when. Yeah, well, I just appreciate uh, the, the the Nevada was one that I had forgotten. Um, I'm going to go to a, another area of topic. There are, unless Matt, you want to ask a follow up on that one. I did, and the go the, the pause there was intentional, just in case we have to cut this, uh, and Mary doesn't want to answer it. But um, one of the <laughs> things that is especially interesting to me is uh, with respect to um, what Paul just brought up. Um, and state legislation uh, geared toward mandating uh, certain action with re with regard to market development. And um, thinking back to some of the recent efforts in the Western Resource Adequacy Program and uh, the issues with regard to state PUCs and, and uh, their frustration um, uh, around uh, 205 filing rights and an inability to, to control the program or, or uh, take a take a greater role um, with respect to governance uh, within the program itself. Is it, I'd be interested to hear if uh, you had any thoughts around whether those types of actions at the state level, the legislation in particular, um, would be counterproductive, um, given those entities like eWeb that that uh, really do value local control, but also are extremely in favor of more of an organized a move towards more organized markets, uh, but at the same time, not necessarily interested in seeing uh, state PUC control over um, how we participate in those markets. And so mm -hmm. there's there's a there's a disconnect there. Um, there is right, and I mean it 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 is a little bit odd because state state jurisdiction doesn't extend to the you know wholesale energy market and wholesale transmission. So, so it is sort of this odd kind of juxtaposition of the state seeing joining an RTO as sort of a tool to meet its other state policies and, and find efficiencies and things like that. Um, but the tool itself is not really a state tool. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that I think that the, the question that I would ask has to do with whether or not that's really the most effective way to encourage an RTO in the West through state policy. You know, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like there's, there's numerous ways to approach state policy. One is to say, thou shalt join an RTO. Um, another way might be to put policies in place that, that encourage RTO development or participation without kind of being such a such a direct type policy would kind of be how I would think about it. I, thank you. I think that was a great response. I think that um, I, whenever we talk about efficient state action, I, I go back to the RPS and uh, get frustrated and move on. So um, uh, I appreciate uh, you're taking that journey with us. Yeah, me too. I'm, I want to move to the more the the market efforts that are act, they're currently going on in the West. From my read, there's two efforts that are going on in earnest. There's the KISO extended day ahead market or EDAM process, and there's also SPP's markets plus process. First, get your read on are they going on in earnest, and kind of your expertise, just that general is this are these processes that are in earnest, uh, and then. You know, you started the conversation around what's interesting to you around the fault lines in previous engagements. And I'm wondering if you have a mental model, like a, a framework for considering when a path is viable and when we will have information to know what we can pick a path because it is viable and we've got a, enough data set, enough information to be able to pick a path. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a super challenging question to answer. And I think I think that the high level the high level answer is sort of we'll know it when we see it, right? I mean, okay. I mean, you know, it's a little bit of a of a non answer. Um, but so I know you'll know it when you see it, and you'll tell us uh, because I'm an enthusiast over here, and I have to rely on some expertise. So yeah. you'll know it when you see it. I'm very confident. Yeah, We're but ultimately too. I mean, I think I think I I will have a perspective. But if you think about 
I, you know, I at PGP will not be making a decision about joining a market. So I think it's, 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 it's partly not, you know, it's, it's the people who will be making a decision about to join or not, you know, it's, it's they who will have to really be the ones that say, we're, we're moving here, we're not moving here. Um, and so in some ways, the answer might be also sort of entity specific, other entities may have different perspectives on when they have enough information to join, you know, a something, some, and some entities may want to say, well, we'll let We'll let, you know, like EIM, we'll let Pacific Core go first and see how it goes for them and, and then maybe consider joining in some at some later time. So I, I, I think it ultimately the question is 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 answerable in a lot of different ways. Um, and and will be sort of diverse um, by virtue of entities that, you know, the diversity in the West. Um, but I but I do think that both. Kaiso and SPP processes are underway. Um, Kaiso, I think, is on a very condensed timeline um, in terms of when they really want to uh, have some um, straw proposals out there in terms of what what their EDAM is going to look like. SPP, I think, is taking a little bit more of a uh, has set sort of less fewer deadlines um, on their process, indicating. You know, we're really going to kind of spend the time we need to to get it right, kind of perspective. Um, but they both have kind of set up a cadence of meetings with working groups, um, and I think what remains to be seen, from my perspective, is sort of how that evolves in terms of what the product offering actually looks like. Um, you know, Kaiso has a process that it typically follows in terms of. Um, um, issuing straw proposals and then final proposals and taking feedback, but it's also using this kind of working group um, structure that it hasn't used before is kind of a new muscle that it's exercising. So it remains to be seen kind of how that plays out, you know, once the sort of working group um, efforts are, you know, translate into a, a design proposal. I think similar with SPP, um, you know, SPP is very member driven and want to take input also from a set of working groups who are working on different topics. And then it's it's still sort of, I think, not quite clear exactly how that then translates into, you know, um, an actual proposal from SPP. You know, I think I do think that the vision is that they will have kind of a, a tariff offering that people can sign up for with Markets Plus. Um, and, and so I just don't know what, what I don't necessarily understand yet or have a clear vision on, on is sort of how where we are now translates into a, a full blown proposal that people can kind of evaluate the costs and benefits of uh, participation in either one. Um, I, I will say, though, that I do think just talking specifically about EDAM and SPP, um, I, I do think you have to get far enough down the line with both of them in order to do that kind of analysis and evaluation. You need enough detail in order to sort of assess the costs and benefits of the different choices. Can I follow up on that, Matt? You came off mute, but I wanted to follow up. Do you, so what I heard, I wanna know if I heard right, is you think you actually want both to be de developed far enough that you can make a choice. Is that kind of your, your framework is you want both of these to be, uh, in a, a, a similar stage of development so you can evaluate them? Um, or because you mentioned that Kaiso is going faster on EDAM. Um, and in, in some ways, is are they just doing a foot race so they're your first option and then gain momentum? Or do you think we, we your recommendation is you got to wait for both to make a choice? I don't know. That's a I good don't answer. Know. I, I thought know. I was pushing a little too hard there, but I, I, I thought it was interesting what you way you framed it. I mean, I think I think you have. I think I think there is what I have heard from a lot of folks in the region is, it's good to have choices. It's good to have alternatives um, that we're not necessarily that we don't, that we have more than one option as far as the direction that we can go. But I don't. What I don't know. Why I say I don't know is because. At what point do we say, well, I'm going from option A or option B? Like, do you need sort of two fully developed proposals? And it's sort of like, 
you're picking a brand of peanut butter that you like better or or is it do you have to sort of decide before that and i i just i don't know how how much of it is just to your to your earlier point i'm gonna keep going back you you got some great content here some of it is individual entities will decide when they're comfortable and then those first movers ease the friction for the second mover and they ease it for the third i mean that's kind of what i mean i'll just say it. it's kind of what happened with the eim right mm -hmm. you had pacific core and then you had i think it was pge next i don't remember you i'm sure you know mary but you then it was kind of a everybody kind of it was easier if you were the second yeah. or third it was nv energy nv energy i'm sorry yeah i knew you knew. i'm not sorry you got to show off your expertise a little bit <laughs> um you know I, I think i think it's an, it's it's interesting and i think the challenge here um in general is that you know if you look at like the uh state-led market study that was done by um energy strategies and and you know pgp has also looked at some of these things you know there's benefit or the 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 sort of the the benefits and the costs associated with you joining in particular is likely to depend upon who else is also in the footprint that you're going to be optimized with so there's this real kind of challenge in terms of you know does everybody we 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 all think that um, there's potential regional that the, there's potential benefits in exploring these options as a region, but decisions aren't going to be made at the regional level. Decisions are going to be made at the individual entity level, and so there, that's kind of a and and I think you see that in the mar market retrospective. It comes it comes to governance and people's sort of willingness to all move forward in the same direction. And to your point. Does it happen that way where, well, one person goes one direction and in order to get the benefits, everybody else has to follow? I, you know, it's it's a it's it's gonna be fascinating to see how it evolves. It is gonna be fascinating. <laughs> and I don't know if it, I did this intentionally or not, but it's a great transition to our next prompt, possibly. I think Paul's pushing me along. I've heard the uh, I've heard the you know it when you see it standard before, but I've never heard it applied to markets, and so I, I like that. Um, the uh, uh, speaking of markets, right? Um, there we do have a, a new group of about a dozen of the biggest utilities in the West who have come together to uh, announce what is the more phonetically challenging uh, of all the market efforts. I'm familiar with uh, the Western Markets Exploratory Group or WMEG. Um, that happened this past October, uh, that it does, as you know, include PGP members and Pacific Core. Um, they're not developing a market. They are, um, as I understand it, exploring opportunities. Um, so uh, hoping that you'd be willing to share some insights um, that you, uh, you're you willing to, and, and of course are allowed to, uh, to share with us as to uh, what you think we can expect from the, uh, the group and organization. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a, a ton of insight uh, into that. I, you know, Pacific Core um, is a member of that group, um, but at the time that I left Pacific Core, it was it was in pretty um, early development stages. So I don't have a lot of insight into kind of what the current status is or what to expect from that group. But what I will say is that what I'm hopeful that I'm hopeful that what they produce will be helpful and in terms of evaluating the different options and in, and in terms of us sort of understanding as a region. Um, you know kind of kind of what the what the what the what the options are like are there other ways that you know people can some people can go do an RTO and some people can stay in a day head market or you know like is there is is there sort of a like charting the path a little bit more? I'm I'm hoping that what they produce will have have a little insight into that that's separate from you know a market operate an, a market offering from a Kaiso or an SPP. You know that that it's 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 kind of more organic, hopefully, and gives us more context and information about um, what the options are. But but I don't what I I don't necessarily know that's sort of more, more my hope as to what that group produces as opposed to 
uh, having a lot of knowledge or insight on, on, on kind of what those conversations look like right now. Uh, it, that's at least insightful in the, there is, there, it's rational to be hopeful of them producing something. I wasn't sure if the expect it, it was the right expectation to have them that they would share something with the broader region. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was reasonable to hope for that. I mean, I would, I, I hope so. I, I think that, you know, part of the impetus, I think, and, and a lot of the interest in it is coming from um, Colorado and Nevada uh, policymakers and and agencies really interested in how entities in those states are going to move forward. I mean, I know we're coming back to the RTO legislation, but the other challenging thing about a single state mandating that an entity join an RTO is that a single state, I mean, other than, you know, unless you're the size of California, a single state isn't going to be able to, to develop an RTO all by itself. So you, you do kind of have this Again, kind of this odd framework where, um, you know, it's sort of like you're required to get yourself invited to a party. Um, and <laughs> That's a callback. That was a callback for the like the very beginning of this episode. It's great. I love it. It's, it really so, good. so I think I so I think there's a lot of interest from the policymakers on the WMAG and and kind of what that produces because it I think they're hopeful that it sort of charts a path for, like I say, how how, how those entities are going to get themselves invited um with the group so I, i'm hopeful that that means something will be uh, there will be a, a work product coming out of that but again i'm not absolutely positive about that i wanted to make a gimli or boromir joke about ERCOT, but uh, I'll, I'll i'll leave that alone the uh, uh question i had with respect to kind of work product um to your point is uh, and not being eWeb is not a member. I have not been uh, a party to the conversations, and so I don't even know if it's a rational question to ask. But curious how they're weighing um, the possibility of of legislation in the Kaiso uh, to deal with the governance issues there, and whether or not you think that that is uh, uh, a sufficient hurdle to uh, to hold up or or direct conversations accordingly. Uh, so I don't know how they are looking at that question. Um, what I, what I do know is that I think that there is a, fi a fair amount of consensus, um, across the West that, you know, for an RTO to be successful, the governance structure, the, the sort of governing body needs to be independent. Um, and, and so I think it has to factor in, in some way in that regard. Um, but I'm not sure how they're thinking about it. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to follow up on another kind of link to this question about first movers and how that can be helpful to uh, getting momentum on a market direction. Now, I was thinking maybe the Western Markets Exploratory Group and exploring these options was, you know, in some ways thinking of you know, the mutual benefit of all of them acting similarly. Uh, but uh, leaving that for a minute, you know, when we had John Harrison on, Matt and I, but well, we'll do a plug for a previous episode that he was on. And he talked about Bonneville taking a leadership position in this markets conversation and wanting to be a vocal uh, leader in this topic. Uh, how important is that to the Western markets actually moving forward to have Bonneville engaged um, it's both a plug for a prior episode, but also a plug for Bonneville and their engagement. At the, what, what, what's your perspective on that? I mean, I just think Bonneville, I, I think any effort that doesn't recognize the role of Bonneville in the West is, I, I think I think any, any exercise needs to recognize Bonneville's role. Um, but Bonneville has a lot of, of, there's a lot of challenging dynamics there to what you know which i'm learning about and which the again plugging the market retrospective um kind of you know goes in goes into that so i think it's i think probably people have a lot of different perspective on sort of who is a first mover and who isn't and so i i wouldn't i i, I don't opine on that um but but i just oh. think it's Oh, sorry, I will separate. I will separate conceptually the difference between being a leader in development of the market and a first mover. And I think there is a distinction there that probably John was very aware, right? I think yeah. uh, that there is a distinction in leading in development and probably not being a first mover. 
absolutely. I think that's a solid clarification. Um, but yeah, uh, some difficult dynamics, I think is a very, uh, very generous, generous way of stating that. Um, and that was very well done. Um, so, uh, so yeah, thank you. So Paul focused, Paul, not just Paul, Paul and I um, focused on market activities in the region with our questions so far, um, which is fun and interesting and we appreciate that. But uh, potentially most importantly, is there anything that you're excited to talk about that we have yet to touch on and bring up besides Lord of the Rings? I do, I, you know, I Lord of the Rings is, is pretty exciting to talk about, though I realize too I that agree. I, um, I just forget, I forget, I forget things as time goes on. And I probably couldn't even really tell you, I probably read those books three or four times and I, I don't even know if I were, barely remember what those characters did in those books. So, um, so I think I already kind of mentioned this, but I think what the, the things that I, I get really excited about sort of challenging complex issues and this, this real intersection between, um, you know, carbon policy and markets is, is, is just super exciting, I think, to, and super complex and, and interesting. And if you think about, you know, if you guys haven't been close to the uh, work on CETA implementation in Washington, uh, you're very lucky. If you have been close to it, <laughs> you have been close to it, um, you know that, you know, the, the sort of, the debate has really been about, um, you know, how can Washington really uh, drive and regulate the energy that is used to serve its load? And, and, and there's really this drive to really understand which, which electrons are serving Washington's load and, and getting to a level of real granularity on that um, and then regulating it. And, and at the same time, markets are really about, you know, moving in the opposite direction, <laughs> really expanding the market footprint so that actually your load, if it's in a footprint, is being served by a pool of resources that are undifferentiated. And, and, and lots of states are looking at this same question that Washington is looking at. How can I tell, how can I have confidence that only certain kinds of energy are being delivered to my load or that my, my utilities are only buying certain kinds of energy, yet still let them participate in a market um, that enables benefits in terms of renewable integration and um, capacity benefits and reduced emissions and, and other things that ostensibly are also consistent with those state goals. Um, so it's just, I just, it's, it's just this like super difficult nut to crack and I love having conversation, like deep in the weeds, nerdy conversations about it. Um, if anybody ever wants to, uh. <laughs> that's that's exactly why we're here. And I'm laughing because for those of you uh, who are just listening and not watching, Paul and I have been nodding like bobbleheads this entire time. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that. Um, just a beautiful a articulation of the of the core issue. Well done. This is that. Yeah, I don't think I am smart enough to actually have that very deep conversation with you in the weeds. I wish I was. To say well, that. Well, I appreciate. It. I I actually I it, sometimes it's sometimes it's uh, challenging to um, e explain because people it's very it's kind of arcane detailed issues that don't go over well in sort of an elevator speech. Um, so I've. I, I've, I've tried to get better at doing that, but it's, it's, it's really challenging to articulate kind of the, um, what the tension is there. Well, I think you did a great job here. And so if you ever need to do it again, just rewind, you go to the app, <laughs> you find public power underground. <laughs> Uh, we'll I'll give you a timestamp. <laughs> I'll actually put a timestamp in here. Well, I'll call it beautiful articulation of the uh, problems <laughs> of carbon pricing and a you know regulation within an organized market. That's what I'll call it. You just come here in the timestamp, click it, and be like, "Oh yeah, that's that was beautiful." I like it. Yeah, that's perfect. I think uh, one of my initial thoughts was that it's it's almost as if we just need to price carbon. It'd be so much simpler, right? 
<laughs> yeah, but then if you're going to price carbon in California at a different price, you're going to price carbon in Oregon. How the heck is the market going to model those divergent, uh, you know, pricing schemes on its That's dispatch? An excellent side? point, Paul. Yeah. Uh, it's almost as if we need a universal price on carbon. Uh, given where we are in the world, I would say international price on carbon, uh, particularly given how interrelated our market, our electricity market is with uh, that to the north. Um, but you know, I don't see that happening this week. So um, uh, uh, EWEB is the only Oregon member uh, of PGP. And so yeah. uh, the previous executive director and I um, uh, had, uh, it basically became a running joke that every time CETA came up, you just see, you know, Matt leaving. <laughs> yeah, Matt and I are lucky enough to both be Oregon, represent Oregon utilities. Uh, say so that now, but you know, who yeah, knows yeah, what knows. Oregon's going to do next, right? Exactly. No, I will say, I will say that I do think that the, my view, um, relatively more sensible policy that Oregon passed was in part a, a learning, a, a learning, some learning happened um, from the Washington experience. So, agreed. You know, I, I, I don't blame you for hanging up whenever that conversation came up, but. <laughs> but well, PGP Oregon helped us different. in communicating that with, uh, uh, with our policymakers. So. Um, yeah. So thank you for that as well. There's the plug for PGP. Um, the, one. The, the, the many, right? We got the March, <laughs> March gets retro, retrospective. I got it that time. Uh, it's very good. So that, this actually does feeds right into my last question, which is uh, you have deep knowledge on these topics. Um, are there is there like a book club we can join to learn more about markets? Do you I across my Twitter feed? I think it was last week came a, a book called Handbook on Electricity Markets, um, and that really actually has two questions any recommendations on books and two are you on energy twitter i'm i'm not on energy twitter i i hope you've you've picked up on my lack of sort of cultural or uh social whatever awareness twitter i'm not on twitter at all i'm barely on facebook i really uh yeah, we can avoid Facebook entirely. Just get well, I'm out of the meta business. Uh, but I think you'd be a star on energy Twitter. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> star. Well, I That's appreciate that. I mean, I'll have to look it up. I think my husband has a Twitter account. <laughs> I'll look at his. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm probably going to give an unsatisfactory answer to this. I, I thought about it. Um, I even Googled kind of, you know, books on energy markets and there are a lot of them. Um, but I am I am an attorney by training, and and so the the place that I go to um, learn things about energy markets and how they developed is really kind of the you know FERC FERC orders basically. And if and if you look at not FERC's, Twitter, no. If you look at if you look at FERC's if you look at FERC's website, they have a a. a a page called landmark cases and that and and it go you know i mean you could start it probably goes i don't know i didn't actually look so i don't know how far back it goes but you're you're talking you, there's just a ton of history about how we got to where we are and those orders like if you probably if you read them in like chronological chronological order you'd you'd really understand a lot about why electricity markets and transmission work the way they do. Okay. So FERC uh, landmark cases, the links in the show notes and Adam Cornelius is going to come on at some point and, uh, and give us his book review of all of those. Right. <laughs> you think yeah, we, we can get him get... at? You think we can book yeah. him? Well, I think the real challenge would be, to, you know, we, we, we got to find something that he and uh, Joe Fina don't agree on um, uh -huh. so that we can have a debate of sorts. I think that would okay. be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think I, those, those are our those are our FERC stars right there, aren't they? I believe so. I think yeah. the um, awesome recommendation, honestly. Um, I think that the uh, FERC's really good at laying out the uh, kind of the history. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that they're way better at that than they are at allowing you to easily navigate active dockets. Um, I think that's a bit of a nightmare, but uh, uh, I'm happy that that is not. Um, not a regular part of my practice. So, um, but excellent recommendation for, for those of you listening. Um, Mary, thank you. 
very much for the recommendations and for, for your time today and for the conversation. Uh, as Paul already noted, he's going to put links um, to all the reference materials mentioned uh, in the show notes. Uh, I sincerely hope you had a good time um, and that you will come back for some more irreverence and some more informative conversation um, and that you will let uh, PGP staff join us as well, uh, potentially next time. Absolutely. I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to, to you know, be, be here in this public power space and, and um, talk a little bit about markets. Thank you. So I got I got to kind of put this out there because it didn't come up otherwise. Uh, I had a I had proposed a title for this conversation in this interview, which was "Speak, Friend, and Welcome." Ooh. Uh, given the the Lord of the Rings hook, but um, didn't make it, so I'm throwing it in at the end where it'll be easier to cut. Well, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> but you just named the episode, Matt. You named the episode "Speak, Friend." Leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great, yeah. great conversation. Thank you guys. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Thanks to Mary and Matt for their informative conversation. To make sure you don't miss the next episode or other great bonus content, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. That's right, folks, we're on Substack. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. You don't have to be subscribed to News Data to get this podcast, but it sure makes our podcast make a lot more sense. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Public Power Underground is a production of Cloud Scan IPUD and News Data. The views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Cloud Scan IPUD News Data or the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. It's written and directed by Cloud Scan IPUD's power department, led by me, Paul Dockery, and it's edited and published by the stellar team of Pioneer Utility Resources, led by associate producer Sarah Wooden. Our theme song, Roll On Enthusiasts, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch.